For as long as I can remember, wood has been part of my life. The scent of this rare and special wood was present at home, at the neighbors, and in the mosque. Nothing gives me a feeling of utter nostalgia like the smell of wood. But looking beneath the surface of this incense will take me on a journey both dark and beautiful. The scent of wood is part of life not just in Qatar where I live, but in most of the Arabian Peninsula. More wood is burned here than anywhere else in the world. We call this wood. It's also called agar wood, gaharu in some cultures. It comes mainly from India and Southeast Asia. Smell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, to you it might be weird, but to me it's really good because I'm used to it since I can remember. It's like you dipped the wood in a very nice perfume. Could you describe the smell? Happiness, I guess. It's so deep in my subconscious. When I use it now, it makes me feel better. Everyone has their own associations with wood. But above all, it's a communal thing, used to welcome guests or share with family and friends. Yet in recent years, that story has been changing. These wooden chips have become incredibly expensive. And each year, the high quality wood we thought would be there forever when we were growing up becomes harder to find. This is the alley of perfumes in the old souk. Since wood becoming rarer and rarer, I will see now what they have to offer. Assalamu alaikum. هذا من وين؟ من الهند. وهذا الكيلو بكم؟ الكيلو 18000. كيلو 18000. نعم. نفس. عندك شيء أفضل؟ لا بعد أفضل الحمد لله. So basically, all of this is below the average good wood. Which means this is below super. But anyway, I will smell it. Maybe I will like it. Part of the mystery of wood is that it never smells the same twice. Its strength and quality depends on the concentration of oil in the wood. But in the end, it's all down to personal taste. It's actually not bad. But either way, the Indian stuff is not for me. Uh, I'm used to the Cambodia and the Indonesian. This is more intense and fruity. The other one is more fresh and woody. The other one, the type I like. Even if you ask for the best stuff, they will not give it to you right away. You will have to try what they have. First, they will try to sell you what they have on display. You don't get it. They try to sell you from the bags that they have here. You don't like it. They go inside and bring maybe other bags with better stuff. 
I guess we'll see. قول هذا كم بودي؟ وهذا كم سعر الكيلو؟ هذا الكيلو 120 120000 120000 ريالز is 34000 dollars which per kilo is the current price of gold. Yeah, this is much better. What's amazing about this it will definitely stay in your clothes for days. However, the price is too much and they can't afford it. Someone who's been selling wood for decades is Mohammed Al Dilemi. In this storeroom, he estimates there is about $1.5 million worth of the wood. The, the, the good people who purchase the wood, they listen to it. They listen to it. You see? I can judge from listening without seeing. If I, if I move that one, the one from Sabah plantation, you will hear different tune. So it's about how heavy the, the wood. Okay, this is one thing. It has to have a weight. Some people, older people, they will cut it by uh, their teeth. Yeah. And they will test it. If it's m m too much better, then this is good quality. How come the price trouble every few, every few years? I mean, the demand in the market, in the whole market. People are using it more, even here. So in, in so in the Gulf country, they use it more now? They use it more. I use it more, but I don't yeah, know. You use it more. Yeah. I use it more. Everybody is using this. It was the recent surge in the price of wood that made me sit up and stop taking it for granted. When I looked into it, I found that the tree in the wild is verging on extinction in many countries. In a vicious circle, the rarer it gets, the more desirable it becomes, driving up prices and creating a dangerous black market. There are now people getting killed in the hunt for wood. That's why I thought, maybe I should look into it and find out more. Is it going to end in my lifetime? Am I part of the problem? I need to find out. I want to trace wood back from its end users to its source in the forest. Demand has been growing in both east and west. And my first stop is London, where I was recently studying. In London, I discovered more dimensions of wood. Wood is a very hot fragrance, so whenever I wear it, it makes me feel warm. A thick layer of cotton and wool absorbs the smell and keep it for a long time. One of the amazing moments I remember is walking to this university and the cold wind hits my clothes. Then the scent rises up. I definitely enjoyed oud here much more than I enjoyed it back home. For some years, Joachim Grasfeld of Botanic Garden Conservation International has been working on preserving the trees that produce wood. He takes me to the herbarium in Kew Gardens to show me how wood or agar wood is created. So this is the agar wood tree? Yes, so basically there is two genera, which is Aquilaria and Girinops, which are the main uh, uh, groups of plants that produce agar wood. When a tree is wounded, uh, and has open bark, whatever. By what? The, it can be insects, it can be maybe a storm, it can be many different things. So then it provides an entry for microorganisms, fungi. The counter reaction of the tree is to produce a resin, and it's this resin that then shows in these black spots. The sad truth is that the tree only becomes valuable when it's infected and generating antibodies in the form of agar wood. It is quite a rare occurrence naturally. Sort of one, one in 10 trees, as I said before, is sort of usually shows signs of agar wood production while the other plants in the same population may not necessarily have agar wood. And that's why it's a very rare, uh, very rare resource. 
when, when you are in the, in the field, this is very difficult to see whether a tree has produced agar wood or not. So that's one of the reasons why they are often indiscriminately felt, just to see whether they have it or not. And this is one of the reasons why the species have become so uh, threatened these days. The trees have been put on the list of the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, or CITES. In some countries, this has led to a ban on harvesting and then the rest to needing a CITES certificate for export, proving the wood came from a sustainable source. Commercial plantations have also been established, and yet, in the wild, the tree's population continues to decline. So as a consumer who only uses wild agar wood, do you think I'm a part of the problem? Yes, of course, unless it's sustainably sourced and respects the sort of is within the export quotas of the different countries and uh, unless also the CITES regulations are uh, abided by, then yes, then you are part of the problem. One of the things I have to find out is whether my wood is harvested sustainably or not. But the demand for the wood far outstrips supply. In the last decade, there's been a boom of interest in the West for wood oil. The pure oil, or dehnal oud, can be overpowering to those not used to it. Yet, in small proportions, it's a versatile ingredient, as Western perfumers have been realizing in the last decade. Nearly all the major brands now have an oud-based selection. But in Harold Salon de Parfum, there is a French company, Henri Jacques, that was working with wood long before it became fashionable. This is one of our most special blends. Mm -hmm. Here to try. It contains the henna wood, patchouli, amber, vanilla. Great. And how much is this one? It's 890 for 15 milliliters. Wow. And the wood supreme is our small special, unique blend that I haven't showed you. It's our little secret. Mm -hmm. I will keep it hidden. This is a very beautiful blend that we only show it to the most prestige customers, the connoisseurs who can appreciate this beautiful. And how much does the uh, bottle cost? It is 2,200 for a 50 milliliters bottle. It is an amazing present. Because it's something new to the Western world, sometimes the reaction can be overwhelming, maybe. It's something that is not familiar for them. But as they come second time to try it, they will fall in love. So you, you need one, two times to smell it, and then you will want it. I'm still I'm in love with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I keep smelling all day. Henri uh, Jacques have been developing wood perfumes for around 30 years. But this is the first time they've opened a boutique for the public. Henri's daughter, Annalise, is also a perfumier. I remember when I was a child, with my sister, we were uh, uh, discovering the different woods and surprise, of course, because at first, you know, you can be surprised. But it got very trendy in the past 10 years. What do you think of that? I look at this with a, with a little smile in a way that Suddenly, everybody discovered the beauty of this component. For the, for the forest of Agarwood. Yeah. The trend now is creating huge demand. So do you think uh, the end is coming sooner? Now, um, what the other brands are doing, I cannot really tell. But um, in my opinion, um, remaining in the natural cannot go with a heavy, with, with a large distribution. Like mass production. Mass production. Yeah. So if we speak about natural wood, of course, there's a limit. There's a real limit. After smelling Uri Jack's perfumes, I want to meet the man behind them. That means traveling to the south of France to the town of Grasse, the perfume capital of the world. Grasse earned that title thanks to the fragrant flowers that have been growing in the area for centuries. The jasmine that goes into Chanel number no. five is picked from these fields. The town even has its own school of perfume. 
I attend a lesson given by Max Gavari, a famous French expert, or knows as they are called, who has put together scents for Dior, Dolce & Gabbana, and others. He gets his students to sample oud oils from different countries. Thailand is sweet. Thailand is a little sweet. Thailand, it's sweet. Thailand is sweet. Mm -hmm. Indian is good, I see. It's not bad. It's very tasty. It's very edible. Yeah. Mm. Indian is maybe the, the, the best <coughs> kind of civet life. Yeah. yeah. It's very difficult to copy the nature. Yeah. yeah. You, you always miss something. <laughs> The uh, nature is everything. Could be sweet, little sweet, little fruity, little. Then you say, okay, maybe ah, maybe some fruit, maybe something fruity. Then you are going to add some fruit, and then after ah, too much, you know. Hello. Hello. Jack, nice How to are meet you. you. Meet I'm you. good. It's meet a privilege you. Very to happy. see you. Uh, <laughs> So One man who's been working on a certain natural oud smell for decades place. is Henri Jacques. Actually, it is in this house where everything is done, from perfume and creation uh, to distribution. It's not an easy product, oh. It's a very, 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 very delicate product. You need years of sensibility to, to use this wonderful product inside our occidental perfumes and to reach to reach the sensibility of the customers, the ladies, the gents who, who like it. It's an invisible uh, communication of love between a product and the people. You see, uh, I don't know if I explain myself. You did. Huh? But uh, it's very important. Huh? So you s you're saying it took you, you, you knew about wood in the 60s, yes. but it took you oh. about 20 years to make it. Oh yes, uh, 20, 25 years to, to start to start uh, mixing it in different perfume. And how many failures we have passed through mm. eh? until we reach, you know, it's, it's not an easy product. Uh, you put rose in wood, it's, the smell immediately is wonderful. Three, you say, oh, it's rose wood. And uh, one month later, two months later, you smell it, n rose has, dis has disappeared. Mm. So wood is a very powerful product. Eh? And so uh, it's hard to mix it with something else. Yes, uh, and, uh, and you have to be patient with the wood. Mm -hmm. You have to be patient like a beautiful lady. You have to be very patient. And wood is also the same, has the same delicacy. Yeah. Ori gives me a sniff of the yeah, oil yeah. at the base of his wood perfumes. Uh, Th this is pure wood or a few type of wood mixed together? Or what is it, it exactly? I mean it, I it is a different mix of wood because I want to reach the smell of the wood that was available 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. You see? So Why? What's the difference between <laughs> because that was available 20, 30 years ago and I now? I, I believe, I believe uh, with uh, the deforestation, you know, the forest yeah. uh, of wood, they are all, they are all um, cut. Huh? So the wood we have today is not the uh, same as before. It was more animal, there was a more, uh, more strong, natural, strong yeah. animal smell in yeah. the old wood. Uh, it was very sick. It wood. was so wild, so wild, yeah. so sick, so uh, animally, and uh, you know, and and today it is uh, more sweet, yeah, more soft, yeah. Uh, yeah. like a beautiful skin of a lady, for instance. You see, that's it. Uh, so you're happy. You're saying wood used to be wild, and now it's tamed. And now it it's is tamed. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm. The high-quality oud of memory seems to be fading into the past. But my research has taken me to the website of Agarwood Consulting and the man behind it who lives near grass. Alam Mahabi hunts out the best oud on the planet. How did you know about oud? Um, I was introduced to oud uh, when my father and my mother were working for King Fahad Ibn Abdulaziz of Saudi Arabia. When I was 14 years old, the king uh, gave some as a present to my father for his uh, job. And uh, I kept it preciously. I started to, to burn small piece by small piece. And then, yeah, I was in love with this agar wood. What is your profession these days? My profession? I'm an agar wood seller. And uh, the other parts, I work for some uh, special customer, I would say, to look for some very high-grade agarwood. 
As the sun goes down, Alan shows me some of his wares. I brought you a few, well, just a few sample from different quality, different variety. This one is the last piece that I kept from the king. My last piece yeah. from the king. So and, you wouldn't burn this one? Uh, no, it's uh, sentimental. Yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. So this is sinking grade okay. from Indonesia. It is called sinking grade because it sinks in the water because of the oil content. There's a mm -hmm. lot of oil on it. So this is supposed to be the best, and it's not supposed, it's the best grade of agar wood. It smells a bit like, um, like grass, like mushroom also. Alan has a different way of burning wood. It's, hot. it's a mica plate. Uh, yeah. Japanese people use it to, uh, so uh, the, the heat will not be too, uh, yeah. too high. It, it helps to burn yeah. the, the, the wood okay. properly and slowly. There's more nuances. Yeah, it smells like grass. You, yeah. I, actually, it's it's really nice. Mm. I mean, a nutmeg also, a little bit like nutmeg. Yeah, Alan seems to have the same knowledge and passion for wood as a sommelier does for wine. But he's not finished with me yet. So this is the best yeah. agar wood. Yeah. That's the best. But beyond the best. <laughs> There's something for... There's something okay. uh, much rarer. Beyond the best. Beyond, oh, way beyond the best. There's okay. something much rarer, rarer that we call kinam. It's the rarest wood on earth. It's, uh, it's rarer than titanium, uranium, platinum, rarer than diamond. And we call it kinam. And it's, I have one small kinam here. It's not small actually because it's nearly impossible to find nowadays. This one is... Can, can I touch it? Yeah. I've never been lucky enough to smell it, but Kinam has the most prized aroma of all wood. This is Alan's biggest find for a customer so far. 16 kilos of 600 year old wood. It took him five years to find and it went on sale for a staggering $20 million. The price of the kinam is uh, really skyrocketing. It's like uh, it can be for one gram ten thousand US dollar for one gram. Uh, in Shanghai, they they sold uh, a, a piece uh, two or three years ago. It was eighteen million dollar per for two kilo of kinam. Eight, so it's like nine nine million per kilo. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. <laughs> in a week, Alan will be back on the hunt in Southeast Asia. We agree to meet again there, as it is also time for me to pay my first visit to the countries that grow wood and hopefully find a tree in the wild. Bangkok, Thailand. Finally, I'm in the region where wood comes from. For millennia, wood has spiritual associations for many Asian cultures, where its smoke was said to aid contemplation. It may have first come to the Middle East with Chinese traders, and today, it's the Chinese again who are having the biggest impact on the market. Back in Asia, on his hunt for Kina, Alan tells me about the boom in Chinese sales. When did the Chinese start demanding wood more than the rest of the world? Uh, it started in um, 2000. Hmm? 2000, yeah, recently. Because of uh, the economic. Yeah. Because there's more and more rich Chinese and it's really fashionable now. They buy all the highest quality. So the price is rising very, very fast, like every year. Yeah. And can be like 20% also depending on the quality mm -hmm. or the highest quality. What do they use it for? Uh, there's a different purpose f for sculpture, for Feng Shui. They like to put it on a nice place in their, in their home to impress their guests also. And also, 
as a traditional medicine. They don't burn it like us? Uh, they burn it also, but nowadays because of the value, the, the rising price, mm -hmm. skyrocketing price, they also invest in it. Mm -hmm. Like we can invest, for example, in uh, painting, they invest in agave. People's reluctance to part with a wood as investable as Kenan is an obstacle Alan constantly comes across. Especially in Asia, you need to, to have kind of trust with these people. You cannot come and put the money on the table. They will not sell it to you. It's not about the money. If they know that I'm really involved in it and that I really do it because it's a passion, it is easier. But uh, it takes time. You cannot have a kinam. In, you cannot say, OK, next month I want a kinam. It's not possible. It's not like buying a, a Ferrari or... It's easy to buy a Ferrari as long as you have the money. You just go in the shop and, OK, I want this one. For a kinam, it's very different. Yes. Well, who is this customer? I cannot tell you about the kinam customer. It's confidential. It's part of the contract. But from where, at least? Chinese customer. Mm -hmm. mm. Alan has more than 200 agar wood contacts in Southeast Asia. His most trusted one in Thailand is with Sawa, who started out harvesting wild wood, but has since changed his ways. If we harvest the tree from nature, it's wasting to cut down the tree just only for a few pieces. So I start doing a plantation business, first because of money and the second to save natural agave tree in the forest, still in the forest. Overexploitation has led to a ban on wild harvesting in Thailand. And across Southeast Asia, there has been a boom in plantations growing cultivated agarwood. Here, aquilaria are induced into generating their precious resin through chemical injections. Witsawa also uses his own concoction on trees owned by farmers he knows. I will show you the tree that already done inoculation. Yeah. I did it, uh, I think, almost two years. This is the hole that uh, I drill with electric driller, and I squeeze the liquid, the inducer, inside the hole, into the hole. But what do you inject it with? What is this? This is the uh, organic liquid. Anything is food grade. Yeah, but what's in it? Um, I can't tell you everything because it's, it's a secret formula. You can see the ring? Mm -hmm. This ring is antibody to protect itself from the irritation. This is aqua wood. Have can you seen this before? No, this is my first or, time. Or only the finished product that you have seen? Yeah. Yeah, this is how aqua wood form. Uh, it's, it's, how the three form aqua wood. It's really tough. Right it's not the same like the healthy side. The healthy side is moister, uh -huh. but this is dry. It's dry and ha harder. Yeah. Why do you tap the tree? I just want to hear the sound. If any branch hollow, yeah, that means it's uh, time to harvest. Yeah, it's ready to harvest. This one is good enough for a, a normal grade, not a super grade. After the agar wood has been harvested, it still needs to be separated from the healthy wood around it. This is like a wood piece. After done after carving. carving. After carving, yeah, right. How much time he needs to uh, carve a piece like this? I think about three pieces per day. Very slow, right? What about the big one? Uh, this, he start carving without cutting a piece of wood. Yeah? How did he carve the whole thing? This piece take about two months to be done. It will take me a lifetime to do this one, <laughs> and I won't do it right. Yeah. 
A piece like this will probably be sold as decoration. Plantation chips tend not to be the best quality because the wood is harvested after a few years or so, meaning the resin is less concentrated than it is in the wild. Yet, whatever the quality of cultivated wood, in the near future, it may be the only option available for those of us who aren't super rich. I still don't know whether I'll ever get my dream of seeing a wild tree in the forest. But Alan and Wetsawa take me to a special place near the Cambodian border. We're coming to this temple to see a huge and very old natural wood, uh, natural agarwood tree. How old? Uh, older than 200 years old. <sighs> Every year, uh, the, the villager will come in here to celebrate to this tree because uh, uh, they believe this is a holy tree. Alan, would you think this tree would uh, produce kina? Yeah, of course, yeah. It's fully infected. And so it's really precious, yeah. You see this checkpoint? Uh-huh. Yeah, just to save this tree. Uh-huh, so the military <laughs> here just to protect this holy tree. Protect this holy tree and uh, uh, they they will set a checkpoint here to to prevent the drugs to go to Chiang Island. And over the years did anybody try to buy it? It's very expensive. There was oh, he said Japanese people offering uh which Sawa tells me later that the offer was $23 million, which might make this the single most expensive tree in the world. As for myself, well, I've just seen my first wild wood tree. It's actually an amazing feeling. I, just, I don't know how to express my, myself, but I felt it in my guts. It's just beyond amazing. With the amounts of money on offer, it is hardly surprising that there is a huge black market for wild wood in Southeast Asia. This area in Bangkok has become known as Soyarab, or Arab Street. If you want wood, this is where to come. They want to welcome us. Huh? Your friend? Okay. Hi, How are you doing? So, My friend Ali from Qatar. Yeah. Actually, not bad. A bit like uh, the one I. Uh, a bit like. Yeah. Yeah. So the bubbles now are. In the oil is thicker. Thicker, not mm -hmm. very thick, but thicker. Mm -hmm. Smell very similar to tarakan. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who are the customers? Qatari, Qatari, Qatari and. Oh, okay. So. Samba very. Mm -hmm. I can yeah, tell the yeah. smell. Syrian kabut is very new in the market. It's yeah. very wide it's uh, used yeah, yeah. in Qatar. It's just this kind of smell. Okay. That's why I like it. I'm used to it. Yeah. Remind you of your childhood. Yeah. 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 Takes me back. Yeah. Yeah. In lots of these shops, there are chips openly being sold from Cambodia, Sri Lanka, Burma all countries where wild harvesting is banned. How does it come here? I thought it's illegal. But nobody wants to tell the truth. When you ask them, they keep telling, oh, oh I make it legally. Uh, but when you ask about the document, they don't have, they don't have anything to show you. How did they get it if they don't have a document? And they pay for the customs office. So you're saying they, they smuggle it to, to bring it here? They must, they must know somebody inside. I'm trading on sensitive ground here. I was warned in Qatar that poking around too much into wood in Southeast Asia could be dangerous. None of the sellers I meet will talk on camera about their trade. But eventually, I find a dealer from the Gulf who agrees to if his face is hidden. in Cambodia. ما تقدر تقطع الشجرة وما تقدر تصدره 
نروح الكمبوديا والتجار نفسهم اللي نشتري منهم العود نتفق معهم على ان احنا بنجيبكم ومعنا دراهمنا حتى يعني نور من عند شو اسمه من عند الشاشه اي من يندفع لهم كلهم الضباب هي ترى اكثر الامور في امور واجده ماشيه فساد ولخبطه يعني انت الحين تقول ان تجاره العود ما تمشي الا بالدفع والفساد؟ والله في بعضنا ويروح للخليج عادي و... الخليج يروح لهم جاهز مرتب يعني التاج الخليجي ما جاء وفي ديرته وجاهز مرتب ومرخص ونظامي ما, ما يدري وش الافلام اللي صارت It's certainly something I didn't know about. My oud tends to come from Indonesia, where a quota of wild harvesting is allowed. But I've also learned that Qatar and other Gulf states have effectively opted out of the CITES controls on aquilaria, in case it affects trade. The different rules for different countries have created the kind of spider's web on which the black market thrives. I take a secret camera around the shores of Saudi Arabia to find out more. I am even invited into a private flat where the best stuff is kept and other dealers are sifting through products. Where does it come from? What grade? How much? It's from Burma. When it comes to getting banned wood into Thailand, several sellers say we have our connections. Another one said uh, we bribed the, pol the police and he mentioned that uh, it's usually a chief of police or a high rank of police who's in the lower rank to, to do his uh, dirty business. And when they, when they come to uh, inspect these shops uh, and find out about the illegal wood sold there in Cambodia or India, they simply get paid like monthly to keep quiet and let it slide. Another person involved in the trade corroborates this. Everything is depends on the police. If, if they say it's okay, it's okay. Yeah. Otherwise, all of the shop will be erased. So you're saying that all of these shops are in bed with the police? Yeah, even the mafia who sponsor money for the hunter to hunting agarwood from the forest, they're also paying the police to clear the way for them to get into the forest. And on the way back, they pay for the forest ranger. Somewhere, not everybody. Somebody, somewhere, not everybody. So the corruption starts in the forest? Yeah, and in the city also. Then an event in Thailand reveals the human cost of wildwood. This shows the dark side of the agarwood business. Forest guard just got killed a few days ago by illegal poachers. I'm on my way to attend the funeral. Makawan Wantel was the journalist who broke the story. The dead ranger's name was Prasit Kumu, and his funeral is far larger than I could have imagined. Even the governor of the province turns up. Clearly, the killing of a park ranger means something here. Vichran Saimfala was one of Prasit's colleagues. Can you tell me what happened that night? <laughs> ทางเจ้าที่เราเนี่ยได้รับการประสานเอ่อเรื่องการข่าวนะครับแต่ว่าพอคว้ากระเป๋ามาแล้วกระเป๋าเค้าหลุดจากตัวนะครับเค้าก็อ่าหันปืนนะครับหันปืนลูกซองอาวุธปืนลูกซองยาวนะครับย
hunt for the poachers has been intense, with over 200 armed personnel involved. เบื้องต้นทางเจ้าหน้าที่ตำรวจก็ได้มีการสืบทราบและก็ได้มีการจับกลุ่มของสองในสามผู้ต้องหาและก็ได้มีการไปนำตัวไปสอบสวนในเช
kayu gaharu dia pun akan rampas lah habis rugi lah orang asli tak boleh cari makan ah macam ini do you think the tree still has a future here masa depan Malaysia uh, kalau tidak ada uh, orang Kemboja Vietnam Thailand Filipina mau datang lagi ke Malaysia mas kalau tidak masuk lagi dalam hutan Malaysia ini pokok kayu kayu gaharu masa depan banyak dia pokok besar pun kasih tumbang pokok sebesar ini pun dia gali cabut cari IC It was I don't know how to describe that it's exciting and also sad because it was really hard to see it We walked for hours and we didn't see any other tree either healthy or infected and eventually we saw only one tree an infected one and a local tribe member is harvesting this this tree slowly and piece by piece so to answer my original question am i part of the problem well yes i guess anyone using wildwood is some part of the problem with the pressure put on it by people like me in the Gulf, by Western perfumers, by Chinese buyers and the black market, its survival may be reaching tipping point. The stocks in Malaysia and Indonesia, which are said to still be viable, supply just a fraction of the demand. The only hope I can see is plantations, where the tree can live long enough to produce the kind of resin that competes with that of the wild. But that will take time. Until then, all I know is that I will only buy wood from sustainable sources. And that after this journey, the scent of heaven will never smell the same again. <laughs>